Hi, I'm Jeremy Baskets from the History Department, and it's my uh, pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker uh, for the 2019 Kragalat Lecture on Genocide, Mass Atrocity, and Human Rights. The speaker tonight has a lot in common with uh, many of you students because he once was an Ohio Western University student himself. Uh, Pete Kakel, who is our speaker, and I'll say more about him in a minute, uh, graduated uh, Ohio Western University in the 19th, class of 1969, his 50th anniversary or 50th uh, reunion is coming up this uh, year. Um, he was a history major, mark that down. He played soccer, wow, <laughs> there's some historians here. He played, he played on the soccer team, he was in a fraternity, um, he was the lead guitarist of the rock band in your, oh no, I'm sorry, he was a lead tambourinist, we learned today, in the rock band that he, uh, me you no, I, and I also promise you that this was, this is a roast, because he's one of ours, it's a roast, it's not an introduction, so, in any event. Um, Pete actually spent many decades working in the insurance industry, and in his 50s, decided that he had, uh, that he missed history, the love that he, um, the field he'd loved so much as, a, as an undergraduate here, and so he went back to graduate school, obtained a master's degree and a PhD in the University of London in England. Um, and in fact, he's going to be talking about some of the research that he did as his dissertation and that has subsequently uh, produced three books. I think our brochure only gave you credit for two, but I believe there's a third coming out. So um, uh, it's uh, uh, also the case, very importantly, to note that Pete uh, is actually the generous donor who founded this particular lecture series about a decade ago. Pete made a very generous donation to his beloved Ohio Wesley University and to the History Department uh, so that we could have this regular lecture series on genocide in honor of his, uh, well, actually one of his professors is here, so I'll say one of his, prof one of his very many favorite professors at Ohio Wesleyan, um, uh, Bob Kragelot. Uh, who unfortunately passed away in 2006. Um, in any event, Dr. Kekel will be giving a talk tonight, the talk titled Hitler's Indian Wars in the Wild East, the Holocaust as Colonial Genocide. Please welcome Dr. Kekel. Thanks, Jeremy, for that very generous introduction, and good evening. It's uh, heartwarming to see so many people braving the uh, central Ohio weather. I knew when we picked a date that it would be for whatever week, it would be the worst weather day for that week, but I very much appreciate uh, everyone coming out. It's always great to be back on campus, as Jeremy mentioned, our class 1969 is having our 50th reunion, and I'm very much looking forward to that. So this is kind of, for me, a pre-reunion reunion, if you will. Um, it's an honor to give a lecture in memory of my mentor, Robert Kragelot. Fifty years ago, I received a phone call from him one evening, and he said that he wasn't going to be able to make his class the next day on the French Revolution. Would I deliver a lecture? And before I hung up the phone, I said yes, and then I hung up the phone and realized that I had less than uh, 16 hours to produce a lecture about a subject that, let's just say, wasn't uh, right at the top of my list of subjects. But uh, I did that, and so in many ways this evening, five decades later, I'm looking at this talk as kind of coming full circle. Uh, Dr. Kragelot always set the bar high. Professor Smith always set the bar high. And so tonight I'm going to try to do justice to Dr. Kragelot's memory and to his teaching legacy. Before I begin, I have a number of people that I'd like to thank, starting with Don Wright of the History Department for doing all the logistic work for tonight's lecture. I also want to publicly thank Professor Jeremy Vasquez for all his work past, present, and future on behalf of the Craigalot Lecture Series. And I want to thank each of you for coming out tonight and for your willingness to engage in a topic which is both intellectually and emotionally challenging due to its complexity, 
and due to the horrific nature of the subject matter. Sadly, recent events have given a new urgency to my topic this evening. In both the United States and Europe, there is a diminishing awareness of the Holocaust, especially among millennials. In recent years, we've also witnessed a sharp rise in hate speech and hate crimes, as well as a rising anti-Semitism, including violent anti-Semitic attacks. Moreover, we're fast approaching a time when there'll be no one alive for whom the Holocaust was a lived experience, whether as perpetrator, victim, bystander, or witness. So my plan this evening is to speak for about 50 minutes, focusing on the Holocaust origins, context, and content. I'm going to conclude with a brief epilogue, as Dr. Kraglot often did for his classes, and then open it up for your comments and questions. So with that as our background, let me begin. The Holocaust, the mass murder of some six million unarmed Jewish men, women, and children by the Nazis and their collaborators during World War II is the most well-documented genocide in human history. Thanks to almost seven decades of scholarship, we know a tremendous amount about what happened and how it happened. But historians still argue over why it happened. There are many competing narratives of the genocide of European Jewry. There is not one history, but indeed many histories of the Holocaust, each with its own explanation of why it happened. Outside of academia, as historian David Cesarani points out, there exists a standardized version of the Holocaust, a standardized version which informs popular culture, modern memory, and commemoration. In this standardized version, the Nazi murder of European Jews was the outcome of racist and anti-Semitic policies. The Holocaust, in this view, involved the systematic use of state power, modern bureaucratic methods, scientific thinking, and killing methods adapted from industrial production systems. Its enduring symbol is the Auschwitz death camp, a site of a Nazi killing process which relied on factory-style industrial killing methods in specially built gas chambers. In my talk tonight, I want to try to present a fresh perspective on the events that we have come to call the Holocaust. Rather than Nazi racist and anti-Semitic policies, I will place the emphasis on the Nazi imperial enterprise in Eastern Europe and putting this enterprise front and center in explaining why the Holocaust happened. I will suggest that the Holocaust origins, content, and context are decidedly colonial, driven by Adolf Hitler's vast imperial ambitions to create more living space for the German people in Eastern Europe. At the same time, I will try to expand our understanding of Nazi genocidal violence to include the deliberate murder of Jews and non-Jews in Nazi-occupied Europe. In all of this, I will in many ways be challenging this standardized version of the Holocaust. In 1972, historian Jeffrey Baraclough wrote a series of three articles in the New York Review of Books summarizing the state of historical research on Hitler and Nazi Germany. In one of those articles, Baraclau suggested that history is a lot like a jigsaw puzzle. If the jigsaw puzzle does not work out, he observed, the reason may be not that some puzzle pieces are missing, but that we have set it up wrongly. So tonight, I'm going to try to rearrange these puzzle pieces in order to suggest an alternative way to read, interpret, and understand Nazi genocide, in including the deliberate mass murder of European Jews. To fully understand Hitler's imperial ambitions, we have to grasp their immediate historical context. This map shows Germany's 
post-World War I borders where Germany lost a large percentage of its territory on both the eastern and western borders. Adolf Hitler was born into a world of empire, a world where imperialism was the organizing principle of world politics. Compared to the world's other great powers, Germany had been a latecomer to both national consolidation and overseas expansion. Under the leadership of Prussian minister Otto von Bismarck, the forging of a unified German nation state between 1864 and 1871 was a violent process of territorial conquest and expansion featuring three wars of conquest against Denmark, Austria, and France. This process of conquering and integrating these lands into a unified German state resembled the westward continental expansion of the United States during that same period. Bismarck himself called the colonization of North America, quote, the decisive factor of the modern world. In the wake of unification, the German nation state moved to acquire colonies overseas. In 1884-85, Germany acquired large territories in Africa, including present-day Togo, Cameroon, Namibia, and Tanzania. And in the late 19, I'm sorry, in the late 1890s, she added colonial possessions in East Asia and the Pacific. Despite being a colonial latecomer, Germany, prior to World War I, had amassed the fourth largest colonial empire of the day, after those of Britain, France, and the Netherlands. Following World War I, in the German view, harsh and unjust peace terms dictated to the German nation by the war's victorious powers led by England and France had stripped Germany of 10% of its territory and 13% of its population. Germany also lost all of its overseas colonies. So to make Germany great again, a politician had to focus on changing these I'm sorry, humiliating realities and restoring the glorious German past. On July 9th, 1919, the German government ratified the Treaty of Versailles. The signing and ratification of this treaty was a traumatic shock for the German people, who had been led to believe that World War I had ended in a draw and that the German army had never been defeated on the battlefield. For one German army war veteran, that day marked his realization that Germany had actually lost the war. It also marked, according to historian Thomas Weber, his sudden politicalization and, rational and radicalization. It was the beginning of his search for answers to two worrisome questions. Number one, how could Germany's defeat in World War I be undone? And two, how would Germany have to be recast and in order to avoid another such defeat and to be safe for all times. That World War I army veteran was Adolf Hitler. Hitler's answers to those two questions are to be found in his worldview, as well as central policy that flowed from that worldview. His worldview and central policy goals were outlined in two books written in the mid and late 1920s. On your left, Mein Kampf, My Struggle, published in 1925, 1927, in two volumes, which was Hitler's political manifesto and autobiography, and then his so-called second book, written in 1928, which was never published during his lifetime, but which was the source of all his speeches for the late 1920s and 1930s. Born in Austria near the German border, Adolf Hitler spent much of his early childhood in Vienna, where he hoped to become an artist. When Germany declared war in August 1914, the failed artist and social dropout left Vienna for Munich, where he joined the German army. In the First World War, Hitler was wounded on the Western Front and received an Iron Cross first class. Returning to Munich after the war, he quickly became active in local right-wing politics. Hitler emerged as a beer hall agitator and effective political speaker on behalf of the newly formed 
far-right fringe party, the National Socialist German Workers' Party, better known as the Nazi Party. On the campaign trail, Hitler ridiculed as a border politician anyone who sought merely to undo the terms of the Versailles Treaty and restore Germany's eastern and western borderlands. By contrast, Hitler was a self-described space politician who as leader of a new German empire pledged to conquer enormous territory in Eastern Europe and thereby gain much needed living space for an allegedly suffocated German nation. In Hitler's worldview, the poisonous influence of the Jews and Germany's lack of space each posed an existential threat to the existence of this German people and to the survival of the German nation. Early on, Hitler became obsessed with two fantasies, one racial and the other spatial. The racial fantasy was the idea of a Germany without Jews. The spatial fantasy was the idea of Lebensraum, or new living space, for the German people in Eastern Europe. Once in power, as we shall see, he would pursue these policy goals in tandem with genocidal consequences for both European Jews and non-Jews alike. By the mid-1920s, Hitler had formulated two cent central policy goals which would dominate his thinking for the next 25 years. Simply stated, they were, one, the total removal of any Jewish influence from Germany, and two, the creation of a German nation that had sufficient space, territory, people, and resources to be on an equal geopolitical footing with the rest of the world's great powers. In his speeches and writings of the 1920s and 1930s, Hitler would elaborate further on these goals without, of course, hinting at their logical genocidal consequences. Going forward, anti-Semitic ideas would either be emphasized or de-emphasized by the Nazis occurring according to current political cond conditions. But Hitler's call for revoking the Versailles Treaty, restoring Germany's pre-World War I borders, and securing more living space in Eastern Europe would be a constant Hitler theme and a relentless Nazi demand. These two images show two Nazi propaganda posters of the 1930s. The one on your left advertises an upcoming Nazi anti-Semitic newspaper article about racial pollution and the newly promulgated Nuremberg Laws. The one on your right from November 1939 announces that, quote, today's Germany is determined to defend its borders and to guarantee its living space. In both cases, Nazi true believers saw America, as they understood it, as an inspiration, legitimation, and model. As an avid reader of history, Hitler would turn to historical precedent, both for understanding the world and for devising policies for the future. He admired the British Empire, envied Mussolini's modern fascist colonialism, and was inspired by Turkey's World War I eradication of the Armenians. But above all, it was the North American president that was foundational for his obsessional spatial and racial fantasies, fantasies that would in turn drive his future genocidal projects. Like many of his fellow Germans in the 1920s, Hitler was enthralled by the United States, or as he referred to it, the American Union. America, in his view, was the spatial and racial model to be emulated by a future Nazi government. The American Union, Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf, possesses its own land base in its own continent. From this continental land base, he believed, comes the immense inner strength of this state. As the Aryan pioneers of the continent, led by its German settlers, cleared the wild soil and made a stand against the natives, he noted, more and more settlements sprang up in the land. Germans should look to the American experience, he argued, since its population of, quote, largely Germanic elements mixed little with lower colored peoples, end quote. Because they had remained, quote, racially pure and unmixed, Hitler asserted, 
the Germanic inhabitants of North America rose to be master of the continent. In his second book, Hitler declared that Germany had experienced a, dra I'm sorry, a disastrous decline in racial level. By contrast, the, Hitler wrote, the American Union was a young, racially select people, as well as a national community of the highest racial quality. As such, it was a model to be emulated by Germany. Quote, Motiv by, motivated by the theories of its own racial researchers, he observed, the American Union had established specific criteria for immigration, limiting immigration to people with proper racial requirements and in good physical health. This was Hitler's understanding of American immigration law of 1924. 19th century American westward expansion and its brutal treatment of American Indians inspired Hitler and served as a model for Nazi policies of territorial expansion, racial cleansing, and planned settler colonization of Eastern Europe. American race law and racial practices, especially its race-based immigration laws and laws prohibiting interracial marriage and interracial sexual relations, inspired Nazi lawyers in the 1930s and they served as a model for the notorious Nuremberg Laws, the centerpiece of Nazi anti-Jewish legislation. Both of these American models would be cited by Hitler and other top officials to justify future Nazi spatial and racial policy. So what I'm saying here, and again, I want to be very clear, is that these were understandings that Hitler had of American history in the 19th century and what was happening in America in the mid-20th century. And when I say that Hitler read widely, he did. But he didn't read widely to gather facts. He read widely in order to find ideas or concepts which supported his ideas, which he could then use to justify these ideas to the German people. So we have to remember he is writing these words in 1925, 1927, and 1930 before the Great Depression, at a time when America was much admired by the German people for its prosperity. This map is from the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, and what it shows is Jewish populations in Western Europe, Central Europe, and in Eastern Europe in 1923 at the time of Hitler's rise for power. And of the world's 15.3 million Jews, some 9.5 million lived in Europe. And of this 9.5 million European Jews, about 8.4 million, or almost 90%, lived in Central and Eastern Europe, <clears throat> which was going to be the site of Hitler's Eastern Empire. Because what Hitler was saying to Germany is, we need colonies but we don't need those colonies in Asia or Africa. We need a continental empire in Eastern Europe, much like the American empire that was made after the American Revolution in the western part of the United States. And so it was the trajectory of this imperial project, which I'm going to argue, which determined both the scale and the nature of Nazi genocidal violence, including the Holocaust. Because if Eastern Europe Poland, the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, parts of Czechoslovakia and the Soviet Union is where Nazi Germany was going to build its colonies. They were going into the area with the highest concentration of Jews in Europe at the time. This particular map outlines Hitler's German foreign policy expansionist successes between 1935 and 1939 before World War II. And all of these foreign policy successes he achieved without resorting to war. Before the outbreak of war in September 1939, Hitler had accomplished much of his expansionist agenda using aggressive diplomacy backed by the threat of war. On its western borders, Germany had won the return of the Tsarland by plebiscite and it remilitarized the Rhineland. On the southern border, it had annexed Austria. On its southwestern border, it had annexed the largely ethnic German Sudetenland and dismembered 
Czechoslovakia, incorporating the Czech lands and establishing a satellite state. In addition, the new Germany was well on its way to becoming free of Jews. The combination of anti-Jewish legislation and anti-Jewish violence had created living conditions in Germany and annexed Austria so adverse that many Jews voluntarily emigrated. The Gestapo had forced 17,000 Polish Jews resident in Germany to flee over the Polish border before the beginning of World War II. By the outbreak of the war, 282,000 Jews had left Germany and about 117,000 had left Austria. At the end of 1939, right as the World War II was breaking out, only 202,000 Jews remained in Germany and about 57,000 Jews remained in Austria, many of them elderly. So what I'm suggesting is without the attack on Poland and the Soviet Union, without the start of World War II, had Hitler been satisfied with all of these territorial acquisitions that the Nazis obtained because of appeasement from the West and by aggressive diplomacy, what I'm suggesting is there would have been continued anti-Jewish violence, there would have been uh, persecution of the Jews, but there would not have been the mass murder of millions in what we know as the Holocaust. Hitler, of course, had specific aims, aims which were readily apparent to anyone who read his books or listened to his speeches. It was a political program founded on two key policy goals. One, getting rid of the Jews, and two, the creation of sufficient living space for the German people. Hitler sought living space in what he called the one and only place possible, the East, which was his term for Eastern Europe. Germany's future colonies, he told the world, told the world, would not be in Asia or Africa, but would be in Poland, in the Baltic states of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, in European Russia, in Belarusia, in the Crimea, and Ukraine. So in the Nazi colonial imagination, this East was going to be Germany's manifest destiny. This is a map of Hitler's Eastern European Empire at the end of 1941 at its zenith. And so what had happened is the Nazis had attacked Poland, defeated Poland very quickly in September and October of 1939, and then in June 1941, they attacked the Soviet Union, they went into the Baltic states, they attacked Ukraine, and so they had actually mapped out future areas of colonization. And if you can see, there are three lines here. I know they're kind of dotted lines, hard to see, but these were planned Autobahn routes. And so what the Germans were going to do was build Autobahn highways for their settlers to drive literally in their Volkswagens to the eastern Lebensraum to settle. And these kind of ideas show you the kind of fantasy that Hitler operated under, both on a racial basis and on a spatial basis. Because in, after the attack on Poland, Germany actually, German settlers actually began to go east into the parts of Poland that Germany had annexed in covered wagons. And on the, the copy of, uh, cover of your program there is from my book, and at the top it's wagons in going in Nebraska in the 1870s, and the bottom part of that picture is German settlers in the late 1930s going in to annexed areas of Poland in covered wagons, many of which had Hitler's portrait on the side. In 1928, Hitler lamented, quote, neither the current living space nor that achieved through the restoration of the borders of 1914 permit us to live a life comparable to that of the American people. So again, we can see his idea of America driving his thought process. But of course, in 1928, before the Depression, the Nazi party was a marginal, fringe, right-wing party that only got very low percentages of the vote. All of that was going to change with the Great Depression. After rising to power in 1933, Hitler moved deliberately to acquire, in the words of the Nazi Party program, quote, 
land and territory, colonies to feed our people and to settle our surplus colonies, uh, I'm sorry, to settle our surplus population. The question, of course, is what does all of this have to do with the Holocaust? So what I'm arguing is, is that with the invasion of Poland, the Baltic states, and European Russia, in these areas of the highest concentration of Jews in Europe, the Nazi self-proclaimed Jewish problem suddenly got a whole lot bigger. Because instead of the 200,000 Jews left in Germany that had not emigrated, and the 57,000 Jews left in Austria that had not emigrated, the Nazis now an inherited a Jewish population in the Eastern Lebensraum of almost six million Jews. About three million Jews lived in Poland, about 2.5 million in European Russia, and then another 250,000 in the Baltic states. So as a result of this concentration of Jews in Eastern Europe, solving the Jewish problem would now demand much more radical solutions than voluntary emigration. It would require, in short, a war against the Jews. Hitler's wars for living space in Poland and Russia were the largest colonial wars in history. Some three million German troops amassed on the border to attack the Soviet Union. Colonial wars are characterized by their aims as well as their principles. The main characteristic of colonial wars is their aim, not merely to defeat the enemy, but also to annex the enemy's territory and to totally and permanently subjugate the indigenous population. The very concept of colonial war rests upon the principle of total war, that is, a war with no distinction between civilian non-combatants and armed combatants. So, as we'll see in what the Nazis called the Wild East, civilians were targets in the same sense as any armed resistance. In creating his Eastern Empire, Hitler sought Lebensraum on an American scale, a living space for the German people sufficient to that provided by the continent of the United States. In the Wild East, Hitler would look to cleanse this new living space of its indigenous inhabitants, Slavs and Jews, in advance of future German settlement. Once German settlers had reached Russia's Ural Mountains, which is the border between European Russia and Asian Russia, the Nazis planned to erect a defensive wall to keep out, quote, Asiatic hordes and to protect the Nazi empire from, quote, alien peoples, a defensive wall. Simply put, without Hitler's wars for living space in the East, the events we have come to call the Holocaust could not and would not happen. And again, there would have been persecution of Jews, there would have been death in Germany and Austria, but not the mass murder of millions. So if you take Mark Gingrich's class on Hitler and Nazi Germany, you'll hear the phrase, the Jewish question, is how the Nazis referred to the Jewish question and the final solution of the Jewish question. And what we need to remember is when the Nazis used this term, final solution of the Jewish question, it meant different things at different points in time. So originally when they used it, what they were talking about is again creating conditions within Germany and Austria so adverse that Jews would force, forcibly emigrate. From 1933 to 1939 then, it meant voluntary or forced removal of the Jews from the territory and soil of greater Germany. After the outbreak of the war, the policy of removal remained the same, but its implementation changed. The new so-called territorial solution to the Jewish question now focused on various deportation schemes based on the colonial idea of a reservation. All of these territorial solutions were genocidal in their implications as the Jews were expected to eventually die of starvation and disease 
so-called natural wastage in the Nazi colonial lexicon. Within days of his conquest of Poland, Hitler approved the expulsion of all Poles, Jews, and Gypsies from the Eastern Polish Lebensraum and the settlement of those areas with German settler colonists. Most Poles were being removed eastward and their leadership elites were to be executed with only racially suitable Poles eligible for Germanization and German citizenship. As part of this plan, Jews were being removed to a planned Jewish reservation, Juden Reservat, in an inhospitable border area of southeast near Lublin, Poland. Nazi military victories soon opened up other possible locations for this Jewish reservation. In the summer of 1940, following the fall of France, the so-called Madagascar project envisaged the removal of Jews to the French island of Madagascar off the coast of East Africa. The original idea as conceived by the German Foreign Office was the removal of Western European Jews to Madagascar. Not to be outdone, an SS version expanded this plan to include the Jews of Nazi-controlled Eastern Europe, seeing Madagascar as a Jewish co colony run as an SS police state. In the run-up to the June 1941 invasion of the Soviet Union, Russia was seen as an alternative reservation site, offering vast spaces in which to dump unwanted Jewish populations. In a memorandum of March 26, 1941, SS Chief Heinrich Himmler's deputy, Reinhard Heydrich, formally proposed that the Jews be deported into soon-to-be-conquered areas of the Soviet Union, specific to either the Arctic wasteland or to northwest, of northwest Russia or to Siberia. But fortunately for the world and unfortunately for the Nazis, the invasion of the Soviet Union did not go according to plan. With the onset of the notorious Russian winter, the German advance stalled, and the reservation scheme would now have to target only areas which were in Nazi military control and occupation. Deportation would have to be to a Jewish reservation within the German sphere of influence. So when Russian resistance to the Nazi invader finally strengthened, Hitler's changing and declining military fortunes would eventually close out this reservation option and made finding other solutions all the more urgent to the Nazi leadership. So what I'm arguing here is that up through and including the invasion of the Soviet Union in June 1941, the idea was not gas chambers. The idea was to build rail lines, to put Jews uh, on these deportation trains to the east, to let them off at the end without any food, without any clothing, without any shelter in Northwest Arctic or in Siberia where they would all die to death. On November 5th, 1937, Hitler has given his generals a hint of what was to come. The acquisition of greater living space he emphasized, can only be sought in Eastern Europe. It is not a matter of acquiring population, he noted, but of gaining space for agricultural use. So when Hitler was speaking to the German public and talking about living space in Eastern Europe and using the example of 19th century American Western expansion, it looked like to many Germans, a comparatively benign project compared to what Hitler actually had in mind. Because if he told his generals he's not interested in inquiring population, he only wants this territory, what that begs the question is, what is going to happen then to the Jewish and Slavic inhabitants in Eastern Europe? As predicted by Hitler, successful colonization of the East would give Germany a continental land empire fit to rival the United States, another hardy frontier state based upon exterminatory colonialism and slave labor. Nazi colonial plans for the Wild East are best understood as a radical and massive depopulation and repopulation scheme based on pacification and cleansing 
in what the Nazis now called the Wild East. And as you can see here, what pacification of the East meant was shooting anyone who resisted, man, woman, or child, lined up along ditches, shot in the back, the next group brought up. The pacification of the Eastern Lebensraum was a joint project of German army troops and SS mobile killing squads, the Einsatzgruppen, supplemented by German police battalions and locally recruited auxiliary police units. Nazi pacification policy demanded, quote, ruthless and energetic measures against Bolshevist agitators, irregulars, saboteurs, Jews, and the total elimination of all forms of resistance, active and passive. Much of this killing, as this picture indicates, was to be done with nothing more modern than a rifle. Anti-partisan campaigns would be conducted as codified in the German, German army doctrine, where the partisan is, is the Jew, and where the Jew is, is the partisan. Based on this doctrine, every Jewish man, woman, and child was deemed a partisan or a supporter of the partisans and subject to immediate execution by German military or police forces. Although Soviet Jews and gypsies were the main targets, even non-Jewish villages could be destroyed to the last woman and child if anti-German elements were merely suspected. The hunger plan or starvation policy mandated the starvation of millions of Slavs in order to feed German soldiers as well as feed citizens of the German Reich and German-occupied Western Europe. It anticipated the death by deliberate starvation of between 20 and 30 million Soviet citizens within the first 12 months of German occupation. Under this colonial-style starvation policy, the Nazis would use the denial of food to non-combatants as a means of genocide. The Nazis constructed what they called the German Plan East, on, which was put together on the invasion of the Soviet Union. In line with Hitler's wish, it sought a Germanization of the land, but not of its native inhabitants. It was a grand design for exterminatory colonialism and it linked both ideologically and practically the Nazi drive to Germanize Eastern Europe with the involving Nazi goal to destroy the Jews. Early mentions of the GPO made mention of the Jews as part of this overall depopulation scheme. But the final solution of the Jewish question, as historian Christopher Browning points out, soon gained an autonomy, priority, and singularity all its own. In the involving Nazi worldview, the Jews constituted an active and lethal threat, not only to Germany itself, but to the creation of Hitler's empire. The goal was now not murder of every Jewish man, woman, and child with, within the German grasp, including those inhabiting the Eastern Lebensraum. And what I should have stated there was the goal was now the murder of every Jewish man, woman, and child within the German grasp. So what we've seen in these last three overheads then is how Nazi policy against the Jews has evolved from immigration, deportation, now to mass murder, all due to Hitler's imperial ambitions in Eastern Europe. So this is a map of geographies of genocide in 1942 and 1945. So if you were to superimpose this map on the other one, what you would see is there are no Autobahns on this map. Because as the Russians begin to mount active resistance to the Germans, what the Germans know is that now they've got to defeat the Red Army. What Hitler was hoping is the Russian, I'm sorry, the Germans would send three million men the Russian government would collapse and retreat beyond the Ural Mountains, and Germany, in three or four months' time, would have control of the eastern part of Russia. But that isn't going to happen, and so these deportation plans now cannot take place. So what the Germans now do is, is utilize rail lines running from 
southern parts of Europe, western parts of Europe, Poland, from Italy, because now these deportation trains are not going to some Jewish reservation in Eastern Europe. They're going to newly constructed death camps and gas chambers at Auschwitz and at other parts of occupied Europe. In all of Nazi occupied Europe, Nazi terror against civilian resistance to Nazi rule included, included both threats and actual acts of reprisal. Unlike in Central and Eastern Europe, however, there was no open war declared on the civilian population of Nazi occupied Europe. The exception to the rule in both South, Eastern, and Western Europe would be the Jewish population. So now the German sphere of power extends far beyond that map of 1935-39 of just Austria and parts of Czechoslovakia. Their sphere of power extends well into the Soviet Union. By the autumn of 1940, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria had joined the Nazi orbit as satellite states. And so what's going to happen now is the Holocaust is eventually going to involve not only Nazi-occupied areas of Eastern Europe, but involve Hungarian Jews and Romanian Jews and other Jews from the Nazi satellites. Early in the new year, meaning early in 1942, Himmler's deputy, Reinhard Heydrich, invited 15 top Nazi officials to an SS guest house on the shore of Berlin's Lake Wannsee for a general discussion of the final solution of the Jewish question. At this conference in January 1942, Heydrich succinctly summarized the past accomplishments and future direction of Nazi anti-Jewish policy. He noted that the Nazi struggle against the Jews had initially focused on their exclusion from the individual spheres of German life, that is, from civic, social, and economic life, and from the living space of the German people. The regime's goals, he reminded his audience, had been to purge the Jews from Germany in a legal fashion by voluntary or forced immigration. Legal fashion meaning Nazi legal fashion. But now Heydrich noted these provided fresh opportunities to solve the Jewish question. The evacuation of Jews to the East, he now declared, had emerged as the comprehensive final solution, replacing this prior policy of immigration. So this new final solution would be a European-wide project within the total German sphere of power. At the time of Wannsee, however, this Nazi vision was still a colonial-style territorial final solution involving a gigantic deportation program. The Jews would be transported to inhospitable areas in the East where they would be killed through, quote, a combination of inhuman living and working conditions and direct murder actions, although the method of murder was not made entirely clear at the time of Wannsee. In late 1941, early 1942, the Nazi final solution was still premised on the notion of a colonial-style genocide. Meanwhile, as the mass executions in the East continued, between a million and a half and two million Jews and non-Jews were shot by the Nazis into those killing pits during this period of time. It's what's known as the Holocaust of bullets. And it hasn't been until recently when a French priest began to go to Eastern Europe to search out people village by village in Ukraine and other parts of Nazi-occupied Europe, who, although they had been children at the time, could testify to the killing by mass shooting of Jews within yards of where they lived. As the mass executions in the East continued, problems developed with the killing of Soviet Jewry by the traditional colonial method of mass shootings. One, it required considerable manpower. The killing of women and children also imposed, in the Nazi view, undue psychological burdens on the killers. And this process was considered too public because the word of these shootings reached Germany. S German soldiers took pictures of these shootings, wrote a, sent those pictures back home in letters home, uh, 
described these shootings in postcards, and when they went home on leave, they explained to their family what they had been doing in the East. So in response to these problems, the Nazi planners began to conceptualize other potential solutions. In September 1941, a group of Soviet POWs at Auschwitz were used to test gassing, a method of murder first developed in conjunction with the earlier Nazi euthanasia program, which had killed some 70,000 mentally uh, and handicapped and disabled German men, women, and children. In December, gassing of Jews in sealed vans began at Kelmno in occupied Poland. Specifically, Designed extermination centers were now being built on Polish soil, and by July 1942, six extermination centers had been built in Poland to allow for full-scale industrial genocide, a form of genocide unprecedented in human history before or since. So these deportation trains, now organized by SS officer Adolf Eichmann, would head not to Jewish reservations, but to these newly constructed extermination centers in the East. So all of what I've talked about this evening has major implications for our understanding of the Holocaust. And before I discuss the data in this analysis, I need to be very clear about what I'm not trying to do with this analysis and what I am trying to do. What I'm not trying to do is create some kind of hierarchy of victims between Jews and non-Jews. Nor am I trying to suggest some type of crude or arbitrary partitioning of the Holocaust. What, what I am trying to do is to grasp the full scale and true nature of Nazi genocidal violence. Scholarship tells us that Nazi genocidal violence took the lives of some six million Jews and between six and eight million non-Jews. While less systematic than the destruction of the Jews, atrocities against non-Jews rivaled the Nazi murder of European Jewry in the degree of death and suffering they produced. Nazi genocidal warfare against non-Jewish combatant populations resulted in the deaths of some three million Soviet prisoners of war, unarmed prisoners of war, from starvation, neglect, shootings, and death marches, and between three and five million non-Jewish civilians overwhelmingly in Poland and occupied areas of the Western Soviet, Vic Soviet Union were also victims of Nazi genocidal violence. Almost all of these non-Jewish combatants died from Nazi colonial practices or its consequences, including arbitrary execution, as part of anti-partisan or reprisal massacres, deliberate starvation caused by the raising of entire villages or confiscating food provisions, forced labor, malnutrition, exposure to the elements, and disease. About half of the six million Jewish victims have thought to have died in unprecedented industrial killings at the extermination centers in Poland, mostly Polish Jews, Western European Jews, and Southeastern European Jews. Colonial practices of killing and destruction caused the death of the other half. Between 1 million and 1.5 million and 2 million Jews were shot in these open air shootings, which that picture captured. More than 900,000 died in Eastern ghettos or in concentration, transit, and labor camps, and thousands died during deportation or in death marches during the war's final days. So what I'm trying to do with this exhibit is just indicate that of this 12 to 14 million people, about 75% died from shootings, from starvation, from other methods of killing that had been used in colonial history previously. 25% of these victims died in industrial gassing. The other thing that I'm trying to do with this analysis is support the contention that I made earlier that without this invasion of Poland and the Soviet Union, this mass murder would not have taken place. 
So if we look at where these victims came from, 96% of the Holocaust victims were in the Eastern and Central European areas that were the subject of Hitler's Lebensraum. So it's only recently, in the last two or three years, that this type of analysis has been done, which gives us a slightly different perspective on the Holocaust and on what happened. As we have seen tonight, Hitler's central policy goals of removing Jewish influence and creating sufficient living space were suffused with fantasy thinking. In turn, this fantasy thinking provided a warrant for genocide, giving a license for Nazi true believers in Hitler's inner circle to devise and implement genocidal policies according to Hitler's wishes. So there was no order given by Hitler for this genocide this genocide was carried out by his inner circle with his knowledge and with his full wishes. In his youth, Hitler became obsessed with Carl May's Western novels, with their tales of the Wild West and Indian Wars. His fascination with what he called May's Indian books never faded, became a lifelong addiction. As we can see, Carl May was known not only an author, he was what today we would call a reenactor. So that's Carl May in his Western outfit. At the height of fighting on the Eastern Front, Hitler had 300,000 copies of May's Indian books printed and distributed to German troops to help them defeat the Russian Redskins. While the wars for living space against Poland and Russia, Hitler's fantasy of a world without Jews with these wars, it became directly linked to this conquest for living space. In Nazi discourse and practice, the war against the Jews was a central part of and essentially grew out of these colonial wars. They were really two sides of the same coin. In 1928, to conclude, Hitler had fantasized that America had colonized the West after it had, quote, gunned down the millions of redskins to a few hundred thousand and now kept the modest remnant under observation in a cage, a reference to Indian reservations, another colonial solution which Hitler greatly admired. As German troops overran Western Russia in the last half of 1941, Hitler's fantasies again ran wild, quote, the Americans have one thing that is becoming lost to us, he lamented, a feeling for the wide open spaces, hence our longing to extend our space. He urged his colleagues to, quote, Germanize the East by the immigration of Germans and to look upon the natives as redskins. He also compared quelling a partisan resistance in the Wild East to the struggle in North America against the Red Indians. Quote, here in the East, Hitler predicted, a similar process will repeat itself as in the conquest of America. In Hitler's colonial imagination, the Nazi Wild East had become the American Wild West, and German officials in the East called the Russian Redskins and the flat -footed, Jewish flat-footed Indians had now become savage American Indians. In late 1942, as the Holocaust was raging across Nazi-occupied Europe, a Jewish-German emigre from Nazi Germany who had fled Germany in February 1933, which his wife, the German political theorist Karl Korsch, published an article in an American ac academic journal. So this again is late 1942 as all these colonial-style mass shootings were happening. So Korsch observes, quote, the Nazis have extended to civilized European peoples the methods hitherto reserved for the natives and savages living outside so-called civilization. Driven by long-held genocidal impulses and fantasies, Hitler could and did think he was fighting his own Indian wars in the Wild East, eradicating Russian redskins and Jewish flat-footed Indians in the advance of settlement by SS soldiers, farmers, and Aryan pioneers. In Hitler's fantasy thinking, the war against the Jews and the wars for living space 
had become part of the same existential German struggle for existence. So let me stop here. Thank you for your attention, and I welcome comments and questions. Thank you, Peter. I think you've left us with a lot of things to think about. I'm going to be manning the microphone. If anyone has a question they would like to ask Dr. Kakel. I get to carry it over there. In the interest of this is fun, though. Disclosure, this is a fraternity brother of mine. I did not give him a question. I absolutely no idea what he was going to ask. Did you come in? The question was about why Hitler settled early on on the Jews. Besides, they were not Christian. I've heard that as a reason. They physically, they did not fit the Aryan stereotype. Um, they controlled a good part of the economy, I've heard. I don't know whether that's true or not. Could you talk about the reasons why in the early 1920s Hitler picked the Jews to be so much against? So part of it goes back to, remember, German army soldier, they're in battle. The battle ends, they believe it's a draw. And then Hitler finds out when the peace treaty happens that Germany has in fact lost the war. And so what Hitler is looking for, he can't write that the German army was defeated on the battlefield, he's looking for scapegoats. And of course, the Jews within German society and with another societies in Western Europe and Eastern Europe, a long thousand year history of anti-Semitism. There are about 525,000 Jews in Germany at that time in a population of 62 million. So this isn't a large group of people. But what Hitler does is latch on to the Jews and say that we lost this war, not because we were defeated on the battlefield, because these Jewish pacifists and communists on the home front had stabbed the German army in the back, and they're the reason that we lost this war. And so what I want to do, and he outlined this in my comp, is essentially refight World War I, but with a different result. And one of those results was going to be, one of the preconditions of that war was going to be that we have to get rid of Jewish influence in Germany. So when the Nazi party program comes out in February 1920, it has 26 points, but two of its main points is we're going to reduce Jewish influence and get rid of the Jews, and we've got to get back colonies and territory that we lost as a result of World War I, but I see these colonies and territories as being in Eastern Europe. So they were a visible scapegoat, so he was tying into a history of, of anti-Semitism and so they became a convenient scapegoat for everything that had gone wrong with Germany. So that Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, when the Nazis started their propaganda, it was all whatever <coughs> happened in Germany, whether it was the inflation, whether it was the Great Depression, whether it was the defeat of World War I, the Jews are to blame. The Jews are to blame. And so that became the theme. But as I mentioned, you know, they turned up or down that anti-Semitism based on political conditions at the time. But obviously when Hitler uh, came to power, then they started enacting all this Jewish legislation because what they wanted to do was drive the Jews out of Germany. And they drove 60, 70 percent of the Jews out of Germany to go live elsewhere. And unfortunately, a lot of them moved into countries that were in World War II that were cited as living space or living around. So they really didn't escape by getting there. So the Jews became that, that scapegoat for everything that's wrong, all right? And so what I'm arguing in here is that that message was very important, but it became magnified and even more important when we understand Hitler's imperial ambitions in Eastern Europe, because that's where millions and millions of Jews resided and what he never said and never really disclosed what that Lebensraum meant was a series of unending wars. But they were going to drive into the East and the Jews were the first target in the East of these mass shootings. The 
if he'd have been able to keep all of that territory that he was looking for, would do you believe that would have been the end of it with him? I had sent you an email with a question. That, that would be my question because what we have to think here is what I talked about tonight is a lot of things that they planned to happen, that they wanted to have happen, that did not happen or did not happen to that extent. So instead of 20 to 30 million Slavs dying of starvation within the first 12 months of a German victory against Russia, it was three or four million, okay? So they had these elaborate plans. And so if what Hitler thought was going to happen had happened, and that is this had been a blitzkrieg, the Soviet army had collapsed, the Russian government had collapsed and moved west to save itself, and the German army now occupied these areas. These were the plans that were going to take place. And some of the historians that have written about this, and what I would support this argument is, is that let's say that they had the drive into, in, in June, July, August, September, and the Soviet Union was successful. Soviet Union collapses, the government goes to the west. They would have still killed the Jews. They would have put them on trains and sent them to Indian-style reservations without food, without medical supplies, without anything, where they would have been left to die. It would have been genocide, but very different from the Philippine Alley extermination centers. So what that outcome of the war, because the Russians were able to stop that German advance and then fight back is, is that they made these colonial plans unworkable. Not that the Nazis didn't stop killing people because they didn't. Not that they didn't continue to starve people because they did. But from the standpoint of the Jews, that's when the Jewish killing assumed priority on its own and they began to build these extermination centers. So now those deportation trains aren't going to reservations. They're going to the deportation. So that counterfactual that you're talking about there, what if this had happened? is the basis for a lot. And we know this because um, of the documentary evidence left behind. So the, 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 some of the things I didn't uh, talk about was um, in De December of 1941, in the Christmas issue for the German order police, which were police in Germany that were sent east to kill the Jews, in the Christmas issue, they're talking about that our new gains in the East will facilitate not only our colonization in that area with our own settlers, but will facilitate the definitive solution of the Jewish question. So here they're joining those two things together. So all I'm suggesting is one can read histories of the Holocaust, many histories of the Holocaust, which are based on Nazi racial policy, Nazi anti-Semitism, which of course played a large role in this. But what I'm suggesting is, is that anti-Semitism in and of itself is necessary to understand why Hitler wanted to kill the Jews. That it's not a sufficient explanation, in my argument, for this mass murder. Because had Hitler been happy with Austria, with parts of Czechoslovakia and the Sudetenland, and he could have said, look, I restored Germany's borders in World War I on the eastern and western. In fact, I've gone a little over those borders, all without firing a shot. And we've gotten three quarters of the Jews. We forced them out of Austria and, and Germany. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do what we did to the 7,000 Polish Jews. We're just going to take them to the borders of Poland and Switzerland and other places force them over the border and force them. Germany would have been Jew-free. They would have had their living space. There would have been death to Jews and persecution of Jews, but there would have not been that mass murder. So this is, in fact, kind of a counterfactual argument in saying that, you know, we need to include in the history of the Holocaust the centrality of Hitler's imperial ambitions. Without understanding those ambitions, we will not understand why 96% of the people that were killed were in fact killed. Who else would like the microphone? Ask one question. Wasn't Hitler actually partially Jewish? 
I mean, I've heard that. I don't know that that's true, but wasn't his heritage some what Jewish? Thomas Weber. <laughs> Hi. Uh, whoa, that's, uh, my name is Tom Wolber, and I teach uh, German language and literature at Ohio Wesleyan. And um, um, you mentioned Karl May is the German pronunciation, um, who died in 1912, you know, so long before uh, Hitler came to power. And it is true, um, every German boy, you know, read Karl May, including uh, Hitler. However, um, my view of Karl May is a little different. You know, I totally agree with your analysis. Um, um, it's very plausible, you know, and uh, I, not too long ago, I read Mein Kampf with a student uh, uh, in, uh, in, in, in our program. But I happen to know Karl May very well. You know, I have all his 90 plus books at home. And if you look at his, uh, the, the, the first three books are, are about a fictitious Indian, American Indian called Winnetou. And um, on the first pages in, 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 in the first book, um, Karl May laments the fact that uh, the American Indians are being exterminated. He praises them, he lionizes them, he loves Winnetou, he adores him, and he is um, not an Indian hater at all. Um, and because he, he fights for, um, it's, some of it is trivial, you know, but, but he is a fighter for good and not for evil, which is very plain to see in all his 90 books. Uh, yes, Hitler uh, read uh, Karl May, but there is more than one way of looking at you know, Karl May's books. <laughs> um, okay, so I gave uh, a 15 minute version of something about this argument at a graduate student conference, and I was a 54 year old graduate student. <laughs> But uh, in the room was Professor Yehuda Bauer, which is one of the preeminent historians of the Holocaust. And as I was reading my paper, I was watching Professor Bauer in the back, and I thought, uh oh, I, I know he's going to have the first question. And so sure enough, I ended this talk, his hand shot up, and, and he said, well, this is all very interesting, and this comparison that you're making, it was a different version of this. Surely it has to be made. But surely you understand that nothing of what you talked about today in any way, shape, or form had anything to do with why Hitler killed the Jews. And this was my first public paper uh, at a conference. And so I, I'm not even sure what my answer to him exactly was. But, and your question doesn't remind me of that, except that I have that, I have that in my mind. So Karl May, okay, you're right. 
you can read those books and you can read them in a lot of different ways. In fact, I think Karl May was, uh, he wrote a pacifist in Germany and other people. Okay, but what I said is when Hitler reads, Hitler wasn't reading to learn or understand what Karl May was saying. He was looking at this as a schoolboy and as the Wild West. So you actually have statements from Hitler's teachers about he's playing cowboy and Indian games on the playground. Uh, he's doing all this other thing. Karl May wrote 70 volumes. Hitler had them moved into his chancery in 1933 when he took power. He reread those 70 volumes. So the message he was giving, getting out of Karl May was a much different message than what you have described, and that certainly is true. But what I'm saying is Hitler lived in this fantasy world, and so he, his idea of Karl May was quite different than what other people's readings were. And so not only did he print these 300,000 books and say, this is going to help you fight the Russian redskins, when his generals would lose battle in the East, he would say, you should have read more Karl May and throw him a copy of the book. So this was just a fantasy, an obsession in his mind that helped him develop this understanding of the American West that didn't necessarily bear a relationship to history. But this was his understanding and how he was going to use it. But I appreciate your question and, and putting out to everyone that but this shows you how Hitler read and that he picked and chose things and interpreted them in the way that he wanted to use. He went to Vienna in 1912 and heard Karl May lecture for the first time and became a lifelong disciple. And in 1945, in April 1945, as the German Reich is crashing in around him, he's talking, he's putting in his political message about living space and Karl May and the German people must never give up on living space. So I'm just saying this obsession developed early on and shaped this fantasy world which helped him believe that all he was doing was what the Americans had done in the 19th century, and that is driving east instead of west, shooting the Redskins down from millions to hundreds of thousands, which is of course not what happened in the American West. But my point is, it doesn't make any you know, if you want to talk about fake news, if you want to talk about all kinds of things. If the truth didn't matter, no. it never mattered. is what his mind told him had happened. And so this was a convenient argument to use to justify what he was going to do. In other words, we just want what the Americans have. We want their living space. We want their standard of living. We want their racial laws. That's all that we want. And that kind of moderated what the real plan in there was. Dr. Alan Arnold. <laughs> okay, so I had this brief flash the first time that you mentioned um, this idea of, of Hitler as a, as a misreader of literature. And now as you were answering Tom's question, it solidified in my head the, kind of the question that I want to ask. Given the eagle's nest and his also romanticized um, Bavarianness that he also, uh, Hitler's romanticized Bavarianness. Bavar his, his obsession, what? I'll, I'll. Yeah. Okay, um, I was probably holding the microphone badly. Um, Okay, and then given the eagle's nest and his obsession with a fictional Bavaria, did Hitler ever write anything about Ludwig II? I'm sorry. Who's my obsession? Ludwig II, who also had strange nationalist misinterpretations of myth and, yeah. read a lot of history, and again, he didn't read these things to learn. He read them just to pick out an idea, and I, so he came across this idea of Lebensraum. But the interesting part of that, Hitler was in jail in 1924 for a failed overthrow of the German government, and a guy named Karl Haushofer, who was a person who coined um, 
not Lebensraum, but coined other arguments that Hitler used, came in and lectured. So Hitler had a huge library, all these books. And there's a guy who's written a book on Hitler's library, and what we find out, of course, is Hitler didn't read all, right, all these books. Hitler constructed this library here. This is before power in 1928 in his office, and he's got books and stacks everywhere. So he pulled these ideas just to give justification, okay, to his ideas. Now, you know, as far as Bavaria and the high map and that whole part of German literature, I, I haven't run anything across anything that would say. He wasn't that, um, he wasn't reading it, you know, to develop those understandings. What he was reading to do was to pick ideas and concepts that he could talk about in Mein Kampf that he could then use in his propaganda. So that you, I, you, you also need to stand by the microphone, apparently, because okay. people can't hear your answer. Use your microphone. Sorry. So what I'm saying is he read history and philosophy, and he did that not to develop an understanding of history and philosophy, but to cherry pick ideas. So he had this massive library, he had all these books in his library, which we subsequently have, has been determined by a guy who did this research. He didn't read a lot of these things, but he was, you know, he was from Austria, okay? So he lived on the German border, but he went to Munich just because, you know, he wanted to try to be an artist. But I, I don't think he was in, to these things. Now, there are, I know you do in work on environmental stuff, and so if you remember when Timothy Snyder was here three or four years ago, there are, are people that have written books about German naturalism and the German environment and shown how the Nazis have used some of these ideas from that, you know, to influence what they did, but I didn't come across anything that, any of that had influenced Hitler directly. I hope that's what your question was. Well, Dr. Spa first. As I was looking at the map you gave us of uh, Hitler's territorial ambitions, it bore a striking resemblance to the way the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk turned out in 1917, which is a, what should we say, a German imposed a set of uh, boundaries on the east going you know, practically to the Urals. Uh, if, um, if, if in the case of uh, Hitler, this owes to colonial impulse, what uh, drives it, do you think, in 1917? Is it colonialism? Is it filling out German natural frontiers? Is it retribution? How do they differ? Okay, so there have been umpteen biographies of Hitler, but a recent biography by Thomas Weber, I, is a German historian, I find very, very good. And what he's arguing in that, he wrote a book about Hitler kind of before World War I and during World War I, then he wrote another book about kind of Hitler after World War I. And, you know, people have been back through everything Hitler wrote or read or maybe it, even lectures that he had heard to try to find out, you know, what were his thoughts before World War I or what was his understanding of Germany or Germany's borders or some of these territorial areas. But what Weber is arguing, and, I, and it makes sense to me, is that World War I was really the defining moment for Hitler when he began to engage in political arguments about Germany's borders in different areas in and around Germany and what those were. And what Hitler decided, well, after World War I, every German politician from the right to the left of the political spectrum was talking about restoring Germany's borders. And so what Hitler came on was this idea of they're all border politicians. I'm the only space politician. So I'm the only one talking about Eastern Europe, colonies in Eastern Europe. And he did this as a different, Weber says, as a differentiation factor. Because again, the Nazi party in the early 1920s and even up to the mid-1920s is very small. It's marginalized on the right wing. They don't have a lot of support. And so Hitler's writing and speaking largely to a very, very small group of people. But I think what Weber demonstrates is 
that the impact of World War I, then Hitler begins to get involved and make political speeches. He sees where everybody else is going. So he sees on this idea of realm politik, or I'll be a space politician because they're all talking about this. I'm talking about that. And of course, what he didn't do is explain to the German people is, if you want that, it's going to involve a series of wars. They had just been through World War I. Nobody wanted another war. Germany had lost a whole bunch of young men in World War I, as all countries in Europe had. So no one wanted war, yet Hitler kept talking about living space in Eastern Europe, and nobody so he had to sell not only the idea of living space, but this idea of refighting World War I and trying to win it. Slater, who is a history major, senior. Uh, my question is also a ter territorial question and also has to deal with uh, Hitler's territorial ambitions. Did he ever clarify how much Lebensraum he wanted? Like, did he ever clarify the limits of now Germany has enough space, we can fulfill our destiny. So in his speeches, what you'll see, and I forget what statistic America has, how many square kilometers America has, but he would constantly say America has this much spare square kilometers of space, and Germany is restricted to this, and we're a suffocating nation. So that's why he kept invoking the American Union and its continental landmass, because in his mind, Germany needed the equivalent of that. And so again, he found that equivalent in Central and Eastern Europe. But you can find speeches in the 1920s and even into the 1930s where he's taking that amount of space that America has, and he's talking not only about Germany, but the Italians have this much space and this many people, and the Japanese have this much space and this many people, and the Germans have this much space and this many people, and so we're the have-not nations. But now look at the British Empire. They have all this space. The French Empire has all this space. The Dutch Empire has all this space. Look at this America continental landmass. So it's kind of the haves and have-nots of the territory. And it's interesting, um, that in the colonial discourse of not only Germany, but Italy and Japan in the 1890s, they're all talking about America. So when I gave you that quote from Bismarck that the colonization of America was the decisive factor in world history, Bismarck is making this comment in 1880, right after kind of the American frontier is beginning to close. And so Germany, Japan and Italy were all using this, and I found my first reference, I found a lot of references uh, in Japan about Indians, I found my first Italian reference, where in the 1890s they're saying we need to carry out pacification in Somalia and in uh, what was then, Lib before Libya became Libya, and we must kill the, you know, the redskins in the similar fashion. So this colonial discourse that Hitler is picking up on is already existent, because Hitler was never an original political thinker. But what he was good at was unfortunately searching around, picking out these ideas. So he was fitting, trying to fit his ideas into this discourse that was already going on. But he frequently made these space comparisons in particular territory. Is there a final question that somebody would like to? Before we think, so I just have one more thing. you can't ask yourself a question. No, it's not a question. Do you have anything? Let me just read something to you. I, because um, Dr. Kragelot would frequently end lectures about Russian history or whatever the topic was, and then he would revert to, um, to something that was happening in the present day. So one of the things I found, and this will only take me a minute, is both Dr. Kragelot and I were born in Pittsburgh. And my youngest son and his wife live in Pittsburgh in the neighborhood next to the Squirrel Hill neighborhood where in October 11 people, Jews, were gunned down in a synagogue for no other reason 
other than they were Jews because the person who did it believed that Jews supported immigration, illegal immigration to the United States. And he was going to go out and kill Jews. And so when my wife went there in November as we're standing in front of the Tree of Life synagogue saying our prayers, um, you can imagine someone who spent 30 years studying the Holocaust, all kinds of things are going through your mind. But I just wanted to share with you some words that Omer Barchoff wrote, a Holocaust historian. The English translation of the second book only came out in 2009. And so in 2009 in the New Republic, Omer Bartov is writing a review of Hitler's second book, which we talked about tonight. Bartov writes, quote, Hitler taught humanity an important lesson. It is that when you see a Nazi, a fascist, a bigot, or an anti-Semite, say what you see. The absence of clarity is the beginning of complicity. And so, Standing in front of that synagogue and reminding those words, I just think those words are worth remembering. And so in Dr. Kragelot's spirit, I want to leave you with those words because he often left us with things like this at the end of class. Because, of course, history just isn't trying to reconstruct the past. It's about what's going on in the present and what could happen in the future. So I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Thank you very much.